Shalom. I'm Neil, and this is my wife, Jamie. Shalom. Welcome to Jewish Jewels, a program dedicated to revealing hidden treasures in the Holy Scriptures. Each week, we take a different biblical topic and explore it. This week, we'd like to begin with a video clip of Jamie and I that was taken a while ago to let you know what our jewel is. A special jewel. There we are in that lovely backyard in Fort Lauderdale. You probably can't guess the jewel without seeing what supported the swing. And here it is. We're standing right in the center of it, a huge ficus tree. Neil, ficus is from the fig family, fig isn't family. it? Fig family, right, Jamie. And of course, that's our topic, trees in Hebrew, etz. etz. And even the Torah in Hebrew is called etz chaim, tree of life. Tree of life. You know, the Bible is full of trees, from Genesis to Revelation. This is a fascinating topic. I personally spent two years studying trees in the Holy Scriptures many years ago. Fasten your seatbelts. We're going to fly through the Bible in just a half hour, exploring the natural and spiritual significance of trees. Well, we need to start in the beginning, right, Jane? That's Bereshit. the first book, okay. Bereshit, in Let's the go. beginning. Genesis 1, verse 11. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. Genesis continues, chapter 2. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So there were those two extra trees in the middle of the garden. Uh, they were to be tended by the man who was in there. Continuing on in chapter 2 to verse 15, then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And of course, that's what they did. They tended the trees in the garden and uh, there was only one rule. Thou shalt not eat of the tree, tree of, of good tree. and evil, right. the knowledge of good and evil. Of course, we know that that commandment was broken, that mm -hmm. one rule was broken. And as a result, man was put out of the garden. Chapter 3. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Maybe you've never thought of that, but it was God's intention that we be able to live forever. He didn't forbid us eating from the tree of life. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden in a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. We were banned from the tree of life. And that tree of life, in a sense, brought death. Well, that, the tree did bring death, but the Bible has so much to say about trees bringing healing. And of course, that's foreshadowing a tree that would one day bring the ultimate healing. Mm. In Exodus chapter 15, God first proclaims himself to be the healer of Israel. Yes. And it's connected with a tree. Very interesting story. We find in Exodus 15, Neil, that Moses had led the children of Israel through the Red Sea. To a place of water, but the water was bitter. bitter. That was Mara. Mara. Okay, so reading from Exodus 15, 23 to 25. Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. So God healed waters using a tree. Just a few days ago, we found out about another miracle that God is going to do, I believe, using a tree. Oh, it has yeah. to do with this. This is from a birch, birch tree. tree. Right. You're talking about this article. About uh, the bark. Mm -hmm. The article mentions that uh, in the bark there's something called betalunic acid, and it's, it's been found to actually be a treatment. That acid is a treatment for melanoma, skin cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, they're up to the stage now of testing it, testing it on human beings. Really incredible. You know what I think? I think all the answers to life are in the Bible. I mean, God proclaimed himself to be a healer using a tree. We should investigate all the trees. There's probably lots of healing remedies in the trees. There certainly are, Jane. You know, but speaking of trees that bring healing really reminds me of one of the trees that's associated with our home state and with Israel, yeah. the orange tree. Orange tree gives fruit with vitamin C, mm -hmm. often associated with healing. And now we'd like to have you come with us to our kitchen where Jamie and Tanta Rose are cooking up something special using the fruit of the orange tree. Shalom and welcome to my kitchen here in beautiful Fort Lauderdale where the orange trees blossom in the winter and in fact they're green all year long like this Valencia orange tree, Tanta Rose, mm -hmm. that I bought the other day and I know that you know what I'm going to do with this tree when we're finished cooking today. Right, you're going to plant it in the yard and a few years later I'm <laughs> going to come and pick oranges. Exactly right and you know Valencia oranges are mo the most important sweet orange grown in the state of Florida. Really? And they account for more than 40% of the total orange crop. 
So we're going to use these sweet oranges today, and we're using mm -hmm. real Florida oranges yes. to make something. We haven't told them what we're, we're making. No, we are making an orange cake. As a matter of fact, yeah. this is one of Neil's favorites. I've been making this cake mm. since 1971, the year in which I married Neil. And when we go to potlucks, Rose, people will say to me, well, bring your orange cake. Right. Because as you know, right. this cake it's is not... Delicious. It's not heavy. There's no, no it's frosting. Not heavy. It's, it's, it's moist. It's light and fluffy, and you'll really like it. So we start mm -hmm. with fresh oranges. Or if yes. you want to, you can use orange juice from the supermarket. And we're going to get uh, two-thirds of a cup of orange of juice for orange this cake. Juice. And we're going to put that in a bowl, mm -hmm. two-thirds of a cup with a couple of other ingredients. This is a very, very simple recipe. And if you don't have a tube pan, you need to go out and buy one. It's such a good recipe, it's worth it. <laughs> okay, the orange juice and then the oil. How and much the, oil? A half a cup a of half a cup of oil. vegetable oil. And, and then, then I'll help you with put uh, in with the eggs. Four, four eggs. Four large eggs. If you use medium eggs, use five. five. Four large eggs. Very simple recipe. Smells good already. Those oranges, lots of vitamin yes. C. So we're mixing I up love the fruit. Yeah. The orange juice, the eggs, yeah, and the it's oil. Almost done. Yeah. See, and all we have is two, two, in more two more ingredients. Now one of them. Very simple. This is a, a plain yellow cake mix. Don't get the kind with the pudding in the mix. It won't work. Yellow cake mix. I'm going to put the whole package in. Yeah. Okay. And then we have, like we have sometimes, <laughs> Rose, the secret ingredient. The secret ingredient. We always have something. Orange jello. One package, small yeah. package of orange jello. Now that is the surprise. <laughs> and we're going to mix this for three minutes. Mm -hmm. So the batter is nice and smooth. Right. At least three minutes. That looks like it's good enough, Rose. Yeah, it does. Yeah, that batter is nice and smooth. You can just yeah. shake some of that off. Actually, mm -hmm. Neil, Neil and the children will take care of that. You don't have to worry. Oh, about I am <laughs> sure of it. I think I help them. <laughs> good. And now we're going to put that batter in this grease tube pan. Mm -hmm. You want me to hold the bowl for you? Or you can oh, do it? Okay. How about that? Okay. Let me hold it for you. Good. Okay, Rose. So we're going to mm -hmm. bake this for uh, one hour. One hour. At 350. Right. And then it's going to be light and fluffy. Oh, you know, the smell of this <laughs> reminds me of when we ride bikes in the neighborhood. In the wintertime, yeah. you can smell the orange blossoms. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's absolutely a wonderful fragrance. There's nothing like a good orange cake. And we top this one with uh, just a little powdered sugar. Yeah. No frosting or anything. Just kind of get that level. And while you're fixing that, I have one that we made earlier, and we just have mm -hmm. to sample it. So of I'll go course. get that. It but is absolutely you know what? marvelous. Don't forget to send for the <laughs> recipe. It's missing a piece. Of course, I don't believe Neil it. is here. I, I told piece. you it was one of Neil's favorites. Absolutely. There we mm. go. There's the missing piece, and now well, we'll get yes. one for us. You cut okay. this with a serrated knife. Yeah. Uh -huh. Here's your piece. Thank you. Okay. The proof is in the pudding. Mm. Or in the cake. Let's see how those orange trees did. Mm. What do you think? Oh. Light? Mm. This mm -hmm. is absolutely delicious. Mm. You have to get this recipe. Write us for the recipe. It really is my favorite dessert. And I'll give you the address to write to for the recipe in just a few minutes. But, Jamie, first let's talk about the connection between trees and people. Yeah, it's always fascinated me. You know, Neil, there are so many metaphors, analogies, and parables about trees in the Bible. You know that Judges 9 is one of my favorites, mm -hmm. verses 8 to 15. We can't tell you the whole thing, but it's about the trees who went forth to anoint themselves a king. They wanted a king. That's Israel who wanted to be like all the other nations of the world. God was Israel's king, but Israel wasn't satisfied. She wanted a king like another all the king. other people. Well, the olive tree refused to be the king of the trees. Right. The fig tree said, I won't be your king. Even the grapevine The grapevine said, and then the bramble or the thorn, thorn bush said, bush. sure, I'll be your king. And that's what happens when we don't want God to be our king. We submit ourselves to the thorn bush. There's a lesson there in that parable about trees. I know many of you know about Psalm 1. Um, it's about the godly man or woman whose delight is in the law, law of the Lord. It says in verse 3, He or she shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does prospers. What a promise for the one who delights in God, being mm. like a tree. Then Psalm 52, 8 is one of my favorites. I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. And finally, Neil, I'd like to read this metaphor in Job. 
Perhaps our friends have never seen this in chapter 14. This is about hope, about the resurrection of the dead, and about what can happen after tragedy or trial. And many of you have had trials and tragedies, but you know, there is hope in God. For there is hope for a tree. If it is cut down, it will sprout again. Its tender shoots will not cease, though its root may grow old in the earth, and its stump may die in the ground. Yet at the scent of water it will bud and bring forth branches like a plant. You know, Neil, that reminds me that when we go through difficult times in life, we think it's all over. Yes, but then that the, hope. It's just like the trees we had in Florida. Boy, we cut them down. <laughs> That and one they in the front spring yard back up just a little bit of water, a little bit of that water from well, heaven. You know, speaking about the trees in Florida, really my favorite is about the palm tree. Oh, and yeah, I remember Psalm good. 92 that says, the righteous shall flourish like the palm. And it goes on to say they shall bear fruit in old age. And living right. in Florida, we have a lot of experience with both palm trees and, and people who are bearing fruit in old age. Yes. You know, there's a couple of really interesting things about the palm tree that I'd like to quickly share. First of all, palms have a root system that's unique. Mature trees can be just taken out of the earth and moved and placed to a new location. Then they have a very unique trunk. Most trees have the life just around the outer skin, kind of what we call a thin skin. Palms, the life is in the center of the tree and blows to the outside of the tree, don't hurt it. Palms get more fruit and sweeter fruit the older and older that they, well, Palms, even when they're waving in the breeze, almost look as if they're worshiping the Lord. Join us now while our good friend Bacha Siegel, standing in the port of Jaffa, overlooking the Mediterranean Sea, worships the Lord with Hodu Ladanoi, give thanks to the Lord. <laughs>
beautiful Batya. Neil, I'll never forget that evening. Remember, it was a Tuesday, the favorite day for weddings in Israel, and the park where Batya sang was filled with bridal couples. Must have been a dozen. At least a dozen. Boy, was I excited. During the song, you got a glimpse of the beautiful almond tree, the first to bloom in Israel in the spring. Now enjoy another close-up as I read two verses from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 1, about the almond tree. Jeremiah 1, 11 and 12. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see a branch of an almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, You have seen well, for I am ready to perform my word. What a wonderful promise mm. concerning an almond tree. And you tree. know, there's another great promise in the book of Romans, the 11th chapter, about another tree, the olive tree, which is a symbol in the Bible of Israel. Yes. Let me share that. Begins, I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. He goes on to say in uh, verse 16, the root of the tree is holy, so also are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off and you, being a wild olive tree, referring to the Gentiles, were grafted in among them and with them became a partaker of the rich and fat root of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. And then a little further on, if they do not continue in unbelief, they will be grafted back in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you who were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? You know, Neil, there's so much we could say about the olive tree. We even have some, some natural olives here on the table that I think are fascinating. I love olive trees, and I love those ancient olive trees in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I'll never forget the time I was there all alone. Remember on that trip? Yes. And there was a rusty nail on one side of me, and, and there was um, thorns on the other side. And I was meditating on the Lord. And it seems as if it were just yesterday that I was there in that garden. Looking at these olive trees, many of them have been here since the time of Yeshua. And the Lord just dropped a song in my heart that I'd like to share with you as a poem. It's called, Ode to the Olive Trees. Did you see him in the garden as he laid his own will down? Did you see the king of Israel as he took that shameful crown? Did your branches make a roof for him when he came to kneel and pray? Do you feel his peace still covering this garden spot today? Olive trees, olive trees, swaying in the holy breeze, Pour forth your oil of anointing here. The coming of the Lord is near. Yes, the coming of the Lord is near. And like the olive tree, the fig tree is mm -hmm. also a biblical symbol of the nation yes. of Israel. We have and, some figs here today. <laughs> <laughs> and the first tree mentioned in the Bible, because Adam and Eve, remember, they covered themselves with a leaf of the fig tree. Mm -hmm. And the, there's an interesting parable here about Israel and the fig tree in the book of Luke. Let me read it. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they were already budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. You know, Neil, there's another parable about the fig tree that often puzzles Bible readers. It's this one in Matthew 21, 19, where Yeshua cursed the fig oh, tree. Yes. He said, and seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves and said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again. And immediately the fig tree withered away. We asked our friend Randy Smith, a Middle Eastern scholar, about the fig tree and about this parable not too long ago in our Fort Lauderdale home. Let's hear what he had to say. Early in the Gospel of John, Jesus is getting his first disciples from John the Baptizer. And early on, you already have um, Jesus talking to Nathaniel, I saw you under the fig tree. Mm -hmm. That's a statement that wouldn't have a lot of meaning for us today, but the Talmud says the best place to study the scriptures is under the fig tree. Oh. Um, in fact, it, it does have a very nice smell if you've ever spent any time there. But um, what he's saying is, I saw you when you were young, when you were still a student. Mm -hmm. And so many of the many sayings Jesus um, gives are related to the trees. We remember also another one about the fig tree that's a little sterner, where he curses the fig tree coming down the side of the Mount of Olives in the last week of the ministry, uh, earthly ministry. And at that point, he comes up on the fig tree and he sees um, leaves, but he doesn't see figs and so he curses the tree. But what he's really doing is a fig tree has a unique um, way of growing. The, the uh, fruit and the leaves come out at the same time in, in the season. Mm -hmm. So that if you come up on a tree and you see the leaves but you don't see the fruit, what you have is a hypocritical fig tree. 
you have a tree that has all of the show of a fig tree, but none of the fruit of a fig uh -huh. tree. Following that, Jesus goes into the temple and deals with eight different groups of people. He'll deal with the Herodians, he'll deal with the Sadducees, he'll deal with the Pharisees and the scribes. And you, he will conclude that these are folks that have the appearance of religiosity without the fruit of a walk with God. Jamie, the Bible certainly does say that we'll know them by their fruit. Mm -hmm. Now, let's go from the spiritual interpretation of trees to the physical interpretation of trees and focus on the nation of Israel. In the early 1900s, Israel was a desolate land with almost no trees. They'd all been cut down by the conquering armies over the years. The Jewish National Fund was established to purchase and reforest the land, and they have done a wonderful job. The reforestation has actually improved the climate and the health of the people living in Israel. Jamie, when you were interviewing people in the Jerusalem shopping mall, we met Yvonne, and yes. she had something really exciting to say and about the trees. <laughs> but I want to tell you something, that I think the trees that grow in this earth of Israel, with the blessing of God, are totally different than all the trees in the world. <laughs> and nobody will argue with me. <laughs> nobody. You know, Neil, I'm sure that Yvonne was devastated as we were at the news of that July 2nd, 1995 forest fire that swept through the Jerusalem corridor. Yes. It destroyed over 5,000 acres of forest. And That's more than 2 trees, million yeah. trees. You know, trees are precious to Israel, and they are to God also. There's even a new year, a Rosh Hashanah, for trees in Israel called Tu B'Shvat. This holiday occurs when the trees first begin to sprout. There's a book called uh, Trees, the Green Testament that mentions something that the Torah says about trees. Do you know the law forbade war against trees? Mm -hmm. It says when you make war against a city, you may not destroy its fruit trees. That's what the Bible says. Imagine that. What a loving God. He even cares about trees. On our last trip to Israel, we planted a tiny pine tree in a beautiful, peaceful spot in Jerusalem under a towering pine. When we come to the land, we're supposed to plant a tree. So here we have a pine tree. And look at this. There's even a worm in, this, in the hole here. He's ready. He's ready to, to help us to leave, <laughs> a, living, this rich soil. To leave a living reminder of That's our right. visit Let's to the it. land. So we'll plant the tree and we'll put a little, little earth around it. And then we'll have to come back to see it grow every year, of course. Here's another, <laughs> another little worm. I'll put him in there with it. Great. And this is how this entire land, which at one time was practically all desert, has been reclaimed for use. Neil, I'm sure that pine tree is no longer little. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> <laughs> you know that since I was a child, I've just loved trees. I made a clubhouse and a huge pine tree on our property by hanging blankets and sheets from its branches. I used to climb a big cherry tree, and I loved the maple trees we had in the fall. I would rake their leaves and jump in them with my brother. We loved that. And then I had a favorite Macintosh apple tree. And if you've seen our Song of Songs program, you know about that. Some things never change. I'm still climbing trees, and so is Neil. Join the Lash family now for a moment as we climb our favorite ficus tree that grows in a park near our home in Fort Lauderdale. Jonathan and Jesse have no problem finding a way to get up the 12 feet or so to the first level of the climbing tree. I, however, get up with some difficulty and much prayer. Once in my favorite spot, I remain there, cautioning the boys and handing out the snacks, which we hoist up in a plastic bucket. Neil is pretty comfortable in our favorite tree and helps Jonathan and Jesse find new places to explore. Some of the areas in the tree are rooms with special names, our boys love to use their imagination when they climb their favorite tree. It's a real joy to be able to share an experience like that with our children, isn't Absolutely. it, Jamie? Now, but there's a far greater joy connected with another tree that we'd like to mention before we close the program. This tree has been a stumbling block to our Jewish people throughout the ages. It's the tree of sacrifice, the cross. What was the cross? Well, before we give you a spiritual explanation, let's see exactly what the tree looked like. A replica is found at Tantur outside of Jerusalem. Neil, this is a typical Roman crucifixion cross. Mostly they used olive trees, so it would not be high as we're used to sometimes seeing it depicted, but very low to the ground. And usually the condemned would carry only this portion from the place of judgment to the place of crucifixion. And then they would nail him to the tree and they would tie this up there. This is called the saddle and the condemned would pull himself up by the arms and rest on this saddle in order to relieve the pressure 
but it would prolong their agony because they would live longer. Then the Romans, if they wanted to hurry up the uh, dying of the condemned, they would smash the legs of the condemned with the mercy stroke, and then they could no longer push up onto the saddle and they would die quickly. It is not a very pretty sight. No, it's not a pretty sight, but it does give us some insight into the depravity of man's mind when devising ways to torture and kill. We seem to have perfected the knowledge of evil we acquired from that tree in the garden. And this same evil has been behind the use of the cross to terrorize the Jews over the last 1800 years. And really, what was the cross? Merely the altar upon which the Lamb of God was sacrificed. It was his tree of death. For us, it became the tree of life, bringing us full circle back to the garden, allowing us to re-enter the presence of God and to meet with him as friends. You know, Neil, each one of us needs to accept that sacrifice on a personal basis, For to ourselves. accept to embrace what Yeshua did on the tree, and then we're healed, body, soul, mind, and spirit. First Peter says it like this, Yeshua bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. That tree of death, called the cross, brings healing to the whole person. God wants you to be healed through that tree. You are my shepherd, my loving guide. You are the rock in which I hide. You are my song in the daytime and my peaceful rest at night. You are my and my delight. In Yeshua, Jesus, the middle wall of partition is broken down. Male, female, Jew, Gentile, all one in the Messiah. If you are blessed by this program, please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon to get notified when new programs become available. Whether you're reconnecting with your Jewish roots or searching for the Messiah for the first time, Jewish Jewels is here for you. Leave a comment or prayer request, we'll be sure to respond. And for additional resources like books and gifts and articles of Judaica, visit our website at jewishjewels.org. We want you to become part of our Mishpacha family and grow with us in spirit and in truth.